Greetings, mortals. Let's talk harmony on a riff that really just grabs my face muscles and makes me do this by one of my favorite black metal bands. The texture for this riff is quintessential black metal with the tremolo picking, the blast beat, and the higher pitched vocals. But it's also a little unusual because, less common for black metal, the time signatures are a little shifty. It's all either measures of 3, 4, 5, 8, or 7, 8. So basically all measures of 3, 4, plus or minus 1 eighth note. The big structure repeats, but there aren't quite exact repetitions within it. It looks like this overall. But there is some sort of logic to these meters. In the abstract, 3-4 is normally a more stable sort of meter than 5-8 or 7-8, just because it's more common. This is reinforced in this riff, though, by the harmonic rhythm. If we get a 3-4 measure, the harmony stays the same for the next measure. If we get a 5-8 or 7-8 measure, the harmony will change in the next measure. Still a little slippery because you have to memorize when the meter changes, but pretty cool that the unstable meter corresponds to impending harmonic change. Here's a slightly slower, simplified version to help us get our bearings. <laughs> So behind the meter changes and the texture, we have a chord progression, which is already a little unusual in itself in metal. And this specific chord progression is very cool and weird, and it's what I'll spend the rest of the video talking about. A lot of people throw around words like dissonant and atonal when they talk about metal like this, with varying degrees of precision or accuracy. Dissonance is fine as like a general affective descriptor, I guess, broadly speaking, for music that isn't based on triads that is major and minor chords. And atonal is fine, I guess, as a kind of general descriptor for music that doesn't highlight one pitch as a center. I think I'm going to make a visual about some of the difficulties with these words and put that on the screen in a sec that you can pause and look at if you're interested because it's a lot and I will get way too off track if I spend more time talking about these words. Some of Thantafaxith's music is, by a few reasonable definitions, dissonant and atonal, like this. However, and this is where this apparent digression is going, the riff that this video is about is neither dissonant nor atonal. Each of these components of the riff is a pretty standard type of chord, and they work together in pretty traditional ways to make one of these chords the focal point. So first, it would be a real stretch to call this dissonant because each part of the riff is a pretty well-defined chord. I'm going to slow down a bit here because there are a couple things that go into saying this that Theory 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 students struggle with. Some of these bits are pretty obviously chords, and they're even voiced as familiar guitar bar chord shapes, like these. <laughs> Those ones have all the notes from the chord and only notes from the chord. The chord is kind of arpeggiated across the measure. But that's pretty straightforward. We can say that it's all fleshing out the same harmony. But others, like the first chord, are a little more complicated. Here I'm calling it a C-sharp minor chord. If you're a music theory robot, you might say, wait, hold up, a C-sharp minor chord is C-sharp E and G-sharp, but this measure also has a D-sharp and an A-sharp. 
what gives? Basically, there are a few good reasons to more or less ignore those extra notes, or at least subsume them into the, the larger C sharp minor sound. One is the larger tonal context, which treats this chord like a C sharp minor chord, and I'll get to that in a second. Another is that these are pretty common extensions for a minor chord. In jazz and plenty of extended tonal idioms, the major ninth and the major sixth are perfectly acceptable members of a minor chord and don't have to change its function. Another is that the bass note, that low open string C sharp, is the same for the whole section, which makes it more likely that we'll hear this all as one chord rather than like a string of three different chords. And this applies to all of the chords throughout. So yeah, there are some extensions or maybe extraneous notes in some of these chords, but they're basically all chords. Uh, and by chords, I mean more specifically major and minor triads. These chords are also all in a broadly tonal context. There are kind of two subphrases, each of which starts with two measures of 3-4, then one measure of 5-8 with that C-sharp minor chord. These are the one chords. The last chord of the whole sequence is a very clear G-sharp chord, which is the dominant that resolves back to C-sharp minor when the progression restarts. No matter what else happens in this progression, this gives the whole thing some tonal, tonal bones, bones, because this is such a clear example of such a familiar type of harmonic motion, the 5 to 1, major 5 chord to minor 1 chord. It gives everything else a tonal flavor. Definitely not atonal. Even though there are some chords that might sound a little crunchy in the context of this riff, and some motions between chords that are a little unusual, it's all kind of in the service of this very conventional motion of moving to a dominant at the end of the phrase. Before the G-sharp chord, we spend a while on an A-diminished seventh chord, which is acting like a predominant here, a tense chromatic upper neighbor in the bass that then resolves down to scale degree five in the G-sharp chord. So that's the pretty conventional stuff. To talk about the other stuff, it makes sense to switch to a different mode of harmonic analysis. That's kind of what's bizarre and cool about this progression. There's a branch of harmonic theory called Neo-Riemannian theory that you don't really learn in undergrad unless you're lucky and get some cool advanced classes. But it can be pretty useful for thinking about some of the chord changes in this and a lot of music, and it isn't that complicated to get the basics of it. Basically, it involves looking at how we move between chords in abstract pitch space instead of relating everything to Roman numeral functions. Let's look at that first subphrase, which goes C sharp minor, A minor, F minor, and back to C sharp minor. These are three chords that aren't at all related in Roman numeral harmonic theory, but they are pretty closely related in Neo-Riemannian theory. To get from C sharp minor to A minor, you move just two notes, both by half step, the C sharp to C natural and the G sharp to A. Same thing applies for going from A minor to F minor, and from F minor back to C sharp minor. You move the root down by half step and the fifth up by half step in one minor chord to get the minor chord a major third below. I won't get into the names of all these things, but that's the basic idea. These chords are closely related in terms of just moving a couple of notes by a little bit, but they can sound like you've covered a lot of harmonic ground. This creates a neat little circle in the first subphrase. The second subphrase uses a different type of transformation to get to E minor, this time moving the fifth down a half step and the root down a whole step. Then we get that first type of transformation again to get from E minor to C minor. Then there's only one half step difference between C minor and A diminished. And because C minor also enharmonically shares two notes with G sharp, uh, G sharp major, the five chord, we've kind of already started to blend into this dominant function. 
you can kind of start to think of this as already being a G-sharp major chord with some suspensions. So overall, there's this kind of closed parsimonious voice leading circle in the first subphrase, then this different voice leading circle that blends into a linear dominant function in the second subphrase. It's a cool way to get a lot of harmonic colors and still get that nifty feeling of forward motion that comes with tonal harmony. Here's just the chords without those meter changes. So to borrow a common tonal music theory metaphor, that's kind of what's behind the music. And here's the surface of the music again, so the recording. So I used that metaphor about chords and structure being behind the music, but I should mention that it's not a metaphor that I love. It's one that prioritizes an abstract sense of harmony over rhythm, timbre, texture, and everything else. And in this case, they're of course just as important. But I almost never do traditional music theory harmony analysis on this channel, so it's fun to dig into that a little and find out what it can tell us, especially for a riff that shows up pretty nicely under those types of microscopes. And I think that might just be that. See ya. <laughs>